Knowledge is power. And this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your host, Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1-866-820-5528. That's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's bring on the host. Here is Jen Solis. Welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. This is Kurt Dukach. Jen Solis is homesick today. So uh, along with me in the uh, studio, I have Raymond Fletcher, uh, also Dr. Ivan Goldsmith, and Dan Rush, head of the uh, AFCL Union. UFCW. UFCW Union. Sorry, Dan. We also have Mark Terbeek joining us on the phone lines. Hey, Mark, are you there? Good, good afternoon, Las Vegas. Yes, I am, as usual. Yes, welcome, Mark. Um, I'd like to start out with some breaking local news, uh, something that WeCan is very, very proud of. Uh, this week, uh, they announced the Advisory Commission on the Administration of Justice's Subcommittee on the Medical Use of Marijuana. And uh, our president and founder, Jennifer Solis, who is out sick today, uh, was uh, appointed to that as the advocate for persons who use medical marijuana. It's uh, big news. What do you think about that, Mark? I think that's great news. I think it's, uh, it's an appropriate appointment. And it shows that uh, the state of Nevada is looking uh, toward a wide and educated array of people who can address all aspects of medical cannabis use in the state. I think that's really great. Yeah, she's sitting on that board along with Tick Seegerbloom, Mark Hutchinson, Michelle Fiore, Olivia Diaz, and lots of other really great people and members of Metro and lawyers and all sorts of people. ACLU board members are sitting on there. So, you know, this committee was put together to to address the implementation of SB 374 and to also address what needs to be changed in in the laws here what uh this next session so we're really looking forward to hopefully making some really good change and i got a bunch of ideas already on the laws and regulations as i'm uh, going through uh, everything on a line by line basis and annotating everything so uh there'll be uh, lots of good work to be done yes so so so, so mark let me, this is dr goldsmith let me ask you uh, a question um I'm a physician in town, and for about the last four or five years, I've been writing recommendations for patients to get uh, uh, their medical marijuana cards so that they can uh, get legal and and for people with appropriate conditions. But as I got into um, some of these NRS regs about DUIDs, uh, I was really surprised that um, uh, the situation or the quandary most of these patients are in that I'm writing the recommendations for because... They have multiple doctor's appointments, and they may be married, but their wives work, or they have no way to get to these appointments or get the care that they need. But, you know, uh, because if if you're a chronic, habitual medical marijuana user, um, invariably you're going to exceed these legal limits and be at risk for getting a DUI. So um, I just was curious as to your thoughts of where you think we need to go and what we need to do to maybe make some profound changes and things as they well, are now well that's a good question doctor and in, in fact uh you could probably uh, speak to to the science of this uh in a in a more credible way than i but here, here's the issue is unlike alcohol uh, which uh, metabolizes out of the system very quickly such that if you blow uh on a breathalyzer 1.0 or 0.10 or whatever the excess of the legal limit is on alcohol or have a urine test that shows that or a blood test that shows that when you're showing that the uh, substance is actively intoxicating in your system because of the quick processing rate that your body metabolizes the substance. Alcohol does not metabolize into the fat or adipose tissues of your body. It just kind of goes right through you so that it, when you're drunk, you're, you're showing that level. Uh, and when you're not drunk, you're not showing that level generally. Uh, it's not like if you get drunk five days ago you're gonna, and don't drink since then, you're going to blow a 0.10 on a breathalyzer. Cannabis, however, is a different uh, metabolizing agent. It lodges in the fat t- 
tissues or the adipose tissues of the body and takes weeks to completely meta- metabolize out and the metabolites of delta 9 THC will show up as positives long after the psychoactive effect has ceased. And the law really hasn't caught up with that. The law is, is uh, uh, in a lot of these states, and I believe Nevada is one of them, it, it's taking these uh, very minuscule amounts measured in nanograms. And, and the nanogram, I think, is a, is a, a millionth, a billionth. It's, it's, I think it's a billionth of a gram. It's a tiny, tiny particle of it. Uh, and they're finding these um, THC metabolites in people's systems, and that can happen weeks after their last use when there is no psychoactive effect, no intoxicating uh, uh, agency at all going on, and they're laying uh, DUIs on people. And I think what we need is a a scientific protocol that um, factors in, that identifies the, the psychoactively active metabolites of cannabis and uh, makes a correlation between a quantity of them and a level of intoxication that, the, that impairs the uh, driving and represents a, a legitimate threat to the public safety. Does that kind of answer your question? Uh, I think that's a good start. Um, unfortunately for many of the patients who are chronic habitual users, um, they have to ingest so much to get to um, a level where it'll take care of their pain or other symptomatology. So um, I, I'm always nervous when I see these cutoffs, whether it's two or five. Uh, I was talking to a local defense attorney who does a lot of this, and um, they almost took my head off when I said, well, why don't we raise the level to five? Um, I, I think it needs to be more inclusive of um, uh, I'm not sure the police department in Las Vegas really has the expertise uh, or the special personnel to evaluate um, these patients because most of them are not uh, high and they function normally even though their blood tests may seem, um, you know, very abnormal. Well, and a related thing is that Metro is unwilling, I think, to really uh, to put its uh, resources and expertise into determining this. They're just interested in enforcement and imprisonment and punitive approaches rather than uh, a working with the system. Uh, I understand what you're saying and I, I tend to agree. And the, and the question is, uh, the focal question on this is basically, at what level do the metabolites in the system represent an actively intoxicating effect that presents uh, a sufficient impairment to warrant enforcement actions. So, I mean, we're, we're dealing with cannabis as any other medication, and there are other medications. We, we don't want people necessarily um, completely intoxicated on Demerol or Percocet or codeine or whatever operating machinery because there are cutoff levels at which we, as a society, understand that it's not safe. It represents an unwarranted risk to the public health. The same concept should apply to anything that produces an intoxicating effect, including cannabis. But what has not been done with cannabis is to focus on really what that is. Because 8 nanograms or 10 nanograms, that, that's a meaningless. It's a meaningless figure because you will find that in people weeks after they've last consumed cannabis. And this isn't even with the regular users, the, the daily users. Weeks after it weeks after they've had any intoxicating effect. So you can imagine that it's going to rope in uh, and have false positives for people who regularly need it for the variety of medical conditions for which it is authorized. And Mark, uh, this is Dan Rush. Do you you remember in 2010 when we helped uh, Senator Leno draft SB 129, which was the uh, Patients Protection Act? Uh, that would have allowed uh, medical cannabis patients uh, to not be uh, subject to uh, punitive actions uh, uh, at work. And, and clearly we weren't able to affect, uh, to touch the driving area of it. Um, but also in Colorado, California, and, and uh, other states, we were able to beat back even five nanograms. And here in Nevada, we see two nanograms. Uh, recently, I think it was yesterday, another AB2500, which is secondary to the first AB2500, which set the 600-foot law in California. 
yesterday that went down in the, uh, I believe it went down in the Senate. Um, or the, I can't remember if it was a Senate or Assembly. But it passed out of committee with a unanimous vote, uh, and it's going up to next to the Senate Appropriations Committee. Oh, it got out of committee? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's another example of what we have to fight. And usually these, these low nanogram bills um, fall on their faces because, as you pointed out, Mark, there just isn't any reliable science. And frankly, if somebody uh, lit a joint in New Jersey this afternoon, we'd all have uh, five nanograms in our system just from the wind blowing this way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the problem now, isn't it? Yeah. So we're, we're, there's a lot of work to be done on that one, um, and it continues. It requires continued advocacy by uh, basically a whole group of professionals, doctors, patients, uh, attorneys, to really get some sense into these laws uh, because really right now there's no science there's no sense to it there's this vague concern that we shouldn't have people driving who are who have recently consumed cannabis regardless of whether the consumption of it impairs their driving and by the way i do not believe that necessarily the recent consumption or a effect uh, of cannabis a delta 9 thc effect from cannabis necessarily makes one unfit to drive uh, any more than not having enough sleep the night before makes you unfit to drive or being hungry makes you unfit to drive. It, it's all circumstantial, and it re- really requires a, a focused effort to understand what's going on here with levels of intoxication and measurable metabolites in the system that relate to actual intoxication, not perceived intoxication. Don't some states have a waiver for medical patients who... Um um, an exception or some kind of waiver uh, for medical patients who are not impaired. In other words, we're not talking about the recreational users because we don't have recreational marijuana in Las, Las Vegas, but it would seem to me if we're writing um, a medical recommendation for people that there should be, these are people with various conditions, for the most part there should be a waiver for those patients so that they should be exempt from these arbitrary and capricious limits. I'm unaware of any state that has done a waiver per se. Maybe I could be educated on that one, but I am uh, I am aware that a couple of states have simply, some states have simply abandoned. California basically has a uh, an impairment uh, criterion that uh, isn't really related to any level uh, of nanograms of THC metabolites, and it's it's pretty much up to the officer to determine whether the somebody was uh, impaired enough. Uh, by the use of cannabis to warrant prosecution for it, so it's it's really. I mean, like the field sobriety, the field sobriety test, or field, right, exactly the field sobriety test. Or if they that sm- sort of thing. Or if the, you know, the person's not coherent or reactive, but it would seem to me like in the medical patients, it's it's they're going to be chronic daily users. So I'm not really sure that you could have any level that's relevant to those folks. But then how do you get to the point where, you know, the officer pulls over, and Mark, this is Raymond, the officer pulls over the person. If that person, you know, is being irresponsible and consuming while they're operating the vehicle, you know, if their vehicle smells like marijuana, then yes, they obviously have reasonable cause. But if just because the operator of that motor vehicle, their eyes are red, that's not probable cause, you know. And then you have the individual. Can I assert my Fifth Amendment right? not to self-incriminate and submit because the only reason way that they could find out is with a blood test they can't they can't do the line walking thing and right. touching your nose and all these other field sobriety tests there's only one way to do that you know and then going back to the legislation that you talked about i think it's imperative as as we move forward you know that in this legislation we make sure that the officers, courts, state agencies, and whatnot, everyone gets the proper training and education. Because as laws move forward, not everybody is well aware of what do these laws consist of. You know, what can and can't people do at this juncture? And it's unfortunate because it goes into, like we talked about last week, the parental rights case. You know, had that department been educated properly, you know, that situation wouldn't have happened as it was. So that's imperative in any legislation that moves forward. And with whether it's 5 nanograms, 10 nanograms, or whatever, this, this is a work in progress, you know. And I'm not going to say that everything in this legislation is correct because it's not. Nothing is ever perfect. However, 
as a society, we should be able to welcome opportunity to grow and advance and improve on the ideas that we have because no singular idea is a perfect idea. What they thought of 100 years ago, we've adapted, we improved, and we built upon. So we're going to take the ideas and take the foundations of the things that do work in this legislation and use people like we have in Jen and moving forward and improving a lot of these situations that do need to be improved. Well, it's um, a matter of, of bookending the concept, and let me explain what I mean by that. Is is we, we take a position as a community, we take a position to say, for example, uh, if you have a positive of 5 nanograms and you, you've demonstrably not consumed uh, cannabis in four weeks, that that is a, a flawed system and that there should not be any uh, liability, criminal liability, whatever liability on the part of the consumer for that type of test. That's the one bookend. But then there's another bookend, right? And, and I'll just tell you uh, my personal concept of it is, is uh, I did it once when I, when I got my card. I, I took a, a, what's called a dab, and it vaporized my mind. And I'm telling you, I was in no way able to drive. I walked out of the place in my hometown where I live, and I was lost in my own hometown, all right? No way was I in any position to drive for probably a couple of hours, all right? So the fact is, is there are um, circumstances in which somebody is, in fact, uh, impaired to the point of not being able to drive properly uh, or presenting an undue risk of harm to the public. So we have to accept that as a community, that that's the other bookend, that, that there, is, there is that level, and then work toward defining what that is in a rational, realistic way. Because if we do that, it gives us credibility. We can say, yes, we acknowledge there is some aspect of uh, Im uh, impairment that arises from Delta 9 THC consumption, and we should find that line and anything above that and that, does, that would not necessarily rope in constant users. You know, it would not rope in people who have it in their system. But it, it, it addresses a reality that with respect to cannabis that is not necessarily present with respect to alcohol is that you can have an effect, you can have an exhilarating, a high off of cannabis that does not present an undue risk to the public if you're operating in a motor vehicle. Thanks a lot, Mark. We'll pick up with that point as soon as we get back from a break. Coming up after our 420 moment, Dan Rush with the USCW with Dr. Gola Smith and Mark on phone chiming in. We'll be right back. Locally owned and operated TSI, Total Safety Incorporated, has kept our community safe since 1998. We provide superior services offering professional installation, local fire and burglar alarm monitoring, and the fastest response times in Las Vegas. We also offer armed and unarmed security, video security systems, access control, and fire safety installation and service. All of your security needs are covered. Call us at 702-967-0000. That's 702-967-0000 or visit us at TSIVegas.com. Cannabis has been used as a healing medicine for over 5,000 years with no toxic side effects. Is it right for you? The professionals at Dr. Reefer are here to help. Now accepting new patients, make an appointment today at 428-0000. Bring your medical records, or if you don't have them, their staff will work to document your qualifying condition with a 99% approval rate. If you have any of the following conditions, cancer, AIDS, muscle spasm diseases, severe nausea, severe pain, Crohn's disease, glaucoma, or PTSD, call Dr. Reefer today for your free consultation and their money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Call 702-428-0000 to get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. Welcome back. We're, that uh, sound indicates it's our 420 moment, and today in our celebrity spotlight, we have... Hey, it's Dan Rush from UFCW Cannabis Workers Rising Campaign, and our uh, celebrity spotlight today is on Mr. Montel Williams. Um, uh, he is the uh, weekend celebrity in the spotlight today. Mr. Montel Brian Anthony Williams, born July 3rd, 1956, 
is an American television personality, radio talk show host, and actor. He's best known for uh, his long-running uh, Montel Williams TV show, and uh, most recently for his partnership for prescription assistance. And I actually got to work uh, pretty closely with Mr. Williams a few times uh, back in the city of Oakland uh, back in 2010. And I thought he was a great, uh, great spokesman for the uh, for the movement and the industry, and uh, and uh, it was uh, a lot of fun to do that. Uh, he was also a uh, uh, multiple sclerosis patient, also. He uh, is. He is a multiple sclerosis patient, and you, when you spend time in his uh, in in presence with him, uh, it's really clear that uh, he has those symptoms, and it's also really clear the cannabis relieves those symptoms in him yes it does i've, I've known a few people that have had, have had ms and uh it's quite a painful painful thing to see and watch even i can't even imagine going through it ms can be a horrendous overwhelming um diagnosis disease L- lots of spasticity and this yes. is an indication where marijuana is a great drug because uh it eliminates the muscle spasms and the spasticity yeah I also got to work with a with a family, the David family in uh, Oakland, California. They came to uh, Harborside, and uh, Jaden Davis, uh, David, uh, he was uh, five years old, six years old, had a um, form of epilepsy that was uh, overwhelming, and we actually got to watch the treatments happen for three months, and we watched him go from 300 seizures a day down to uh, a week, down to uh, two or three a week. Um, but Mr. Williams was an extraordinary uh, experience to work with. So, gentlemen, do we have uh, any callers on the line uh, uh, on this topic? Uh, yes, we have Jim on the line. Welcome, Jim. Uh, hi, this is Jim. Hey, Jim. Uh, I have a question about uh, CBDs uh, for their use uh, to as an anti-seizure medication. Now, I'm familiar with Charlotte's Web, and I'm familiar with the case you were just talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, however, I'm wondering, is there any research into uh, its efficacy for use as an anti-seizure medication in other kinds of epilepsy? So, well, um, I think there is, actually. Um, there are uh, studies uh, that uh, have been done by uh, Israeli and uh, um, Dutch uh, doctors and scientists uh, directly on those specific systems, uh, or specific effects on it, and basically what it comes down to is they find that uh, high CBD uh, oils uh, do have uh, an effect on the nervous system with respect to seizure disorders, and there's a couple of different ways that they're focusing in on it. Uh, one is uh, as an anti-inflammatory, as a sort of internal neurological anti-inflammatory that they see that some of these seizure disorders are um, arise from uh, inflammation, a sort of an internal inflammation. So just as you'd put a balm or a salve on a cut or, or a bump on your skin to reduce the inflammation or take a uh, uh, ibuprofen to reduce certain uh, blood vessel uh, inflammation, uh, the CBDs work neurologically are believed to work neurologically to reduce uh, inflammation. And in another study, or a series of studies, they uh, in- indicate that it uh, deals with or addresses a sort of a immune or autoimmune response, because some of these neurological disorders are in the family of autoimmune disorders, and that it uh, relieves the effects of that. So there's some real promising research on it, and it's continuing to be developed uh, largely through Israel. Mark, what I think is going to be uh, a probable outcome is is that um, the CBDs are, uh, will be used as adjunctive therapy with a lot of the anti-epileptic or anti-convulsant therapies because a lot of those drugs are toxic. So it allows to use lower levels and avoid some of the toxicities, and I think it'll be an add-on therapy or what I refer to as adjunctive therapy that'll, that'll be combined. And definitely, you see this in cancer already because a lot of the um, CBDs work to inhibit blood vessel growth, like a lot of some of the other anti-cancer drugs, but without their toxicity. So they inhibit um, metastasis. They, they eliminate some of this blood vessel growth that tumors use to feed on. So I think there's going to be a role for this to be adjunctive therapy. My own world, I'm hoping we have something for overweight or obesity. Even if we come up with a strain that you know seems 
inherently not what we would expect from uh, you know marijuana where you usually get the munchies but if we had a strain that could promote weight maintenance after somebody loses weight it would be a multi-billion dollar drug because that's a huge problem uh, people regain the weight after they lose weight so I see it definitely um, as an adjunctive therapy for a lot of conditions where the current therapies are very toxic or have the potential for adverse events and an interesting thing about this is that it works with the endocannabinol system of the, of the body that's there anyway it's sort of a natural thing. It's, it is unlike these toxic uh, uh, um, products that uh, Big Pharma would have you take. It's not liver toxic. It is the opposite of neurotoxic, and it really addresses a number of different uh, mechanisms uh, in the body for dealing with some of these neurological disorders. It's really some very promising stuff, and, and th- we're just beginning on it. I mean, there are over 60 different types of cannabinoids, uh, in uh, cannabis, in the cannabis plant, and you know some of the effects that they're uh, analyzing on this one uh, deal with you know antioxidation effects, neuroprotection effects, anti-inflammation, immunomodulation, tumor growth regulation, all of these sort of uh, effects that that CBDs directly deal with um, are both neurological and and uh, anti-cancer have anti-cancer potentials. It's really a remarkable thing. Let's also not forget that the CBDs, you, you don't have the psychoactive, the typical high feeling that you get, that, you know, and you want to want to make sure that we remind people because when you use the example of Charlotte's Web, we don't want people to think, oh, you're giving cannabis to children. You know, it's high in the CBD. So want to certainly make sure that we remind people of that. It's so, interesting enough, the original name of Charlotte's Web or one of the original slang's name was a hippie's disappointment. Because specifically, it doesn't get you high. It doesn't have that. It's very, very low in Delta 9. Uh, and Delta 9, as we have talked about on other shows, has its place in treatment, pain relief, analgesia. But the CBDs are really what gets you into the systemic uh, treatment. It's more than just palliative. I've, I've been informed also that uh, the CBDs also counteract the effects of the THC so if you have a if you have a strain that has you know higher CBDs in it it's going to kind of bring the t- the the euphoric the high uplifted feel it down um, even if you know it does have a lot of THC in it still and the folks that, that actually developed Charlotte's Web as a strain in Colorado uh, the Stanley brothers some of our first uh, members uh, in UFCW in Colorado uh, actually went to great great lengths to try to establish, uh, because there was no science then, and, and like Mr. Terbeek was just saying, uh, we've seen some science out of Israel that I'm not at liberty to say where it comes from or who has it, but there's, there's uh, what used to be referred to as tumor reduction uh, is now uh, showing to be uh, tumor eradication from uh, direct applications, uh, hypodermic applications of Delta-9s and THC. So the you know the fact that that there hasn't been a whole lot of time to study and there hasn't been a lot of government driven studies i think we're going to see things uh, be revealed more and more that's, that's a big problem there have not been there, the studies that the government has done that, that most of the physicians nobody knows where they are or even are aware of them so that's um that's a major issue because a big pharma has an interest to go out and spend billions of dollars to get a product approved um, but in this particular case, the, the, it's like anecdotal evidence. We all know somebody. I, I, I saw a guy that had a glioblastoma multiforme brain tumor. He lasted two and a half years just on um, the CB1, CB2 concoction, the mixture, the tinctures, whatever. And it was unbelievable. And he was functioning every day. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a lot we don't know. And we have a lot of these anecdotal stories of people sur- miraculously surviving horrible diseases. And we need to get those those that data and we need to um start getting people actively researching more in this area even though there's may not be the dollars to back the fund you know to back it okay we have a we have another caller on the line we have Stuart. Stuart, are you there hello am i on hey Stuart, how you doing hey thank you uh, very good thank you i have a couple of questions one leads to the other i think uh when i think of these cbds i think of it as a, a true uh, i won't say a true pharmaceutical but it, it'll be treated as a pharmaceutical and I'm wondering uh, what you guys see as a regulatory agency that will oversee this that would then, I suppose, be determining dosage, frequency, how to monitor the use of this. And I just wonder, I guess it's not a question more than on 
how do you guys, an observation of how do you guys see this, uh, uh, this shaking out once it becomes, uh, like you say, you're not getting high, you're using it as a true medicine as opposed to a, a medicine that gets you high. Well, And I can, I can take my answer offline. Thanks for your question. Do, um, I'll grow room with that answer a little bit. Uh, there are studies now being done in the Mayo Clinic, and there are also funding uh, uh, grants that are being provided by NIDA. Um, and uh, there's uh, certainly interest in uh, the DEA and uh, um, how uh, um, patents are being awarded. There's GW Pharmaceutical. Um, and these are all things that are, that are happening that indicate that uh, cannabis is slowly becoming mainstream. I had a conversation this morning with a Congress member uh, from uh, Nevada here, and she was talking about her uh, desires to get back to Washington, D.C. and, and start uh, participating in the eradication of uh, cannabis paranoia and uh, the development of um, medical cannabis uh, uh, legislation. So I think uh, at some point we'll see things start turning to the FDA, um, maybe to uh, maybe to NIDA itself, uh, maybe some folks suggesting the formation of a medical cannabis uh, um, regulatory agency in the federal government. And I heard somebody trying to weigh in there, so I think I'll... Yeah, this is this is Mark. Um, but I think right now, uh, for the, the question, if the, to the to the extent the question was asking what's going on now. <clears throat> with uh, Nevada's law. Right now, the regulatory agency is the Department of Human and Behavioral Health Division of Medical Cannabis. And um, they're the ones that are going to be the regulatory agency overseeing the operations of medical marijuana establishments. There is a corollary regulatory agency, which is the Board of Medical Examiners, the Nevada Board of Medical Examiners, that will be overseeing physicians as to whether or not they are over recommending a medical cannabis now because doctors cannot prescribe it as they would uh, a, a pharmacological agent but can only recommend it there is no dosage or dose response uh, guidelines uh, a doctor recommends the use of medical cannabis and the patient then goes out and gets medical cannabis and decides what dose the patient is efficacious for the patient based on labeling. So that's where it stands now. Mr. Rush, I think, was talking about what things might look like in the future once we have full nationwide cannabis normalization. Which yeah. there's definitely a movement for. Yes, yeah, so I agree that this will be a prescription. Uh, I envision a day where the doctor will write a prescription for a tincture, a mixture, for whatever the ailment is, and that's what the patient will get. Well, and, you know, hof and hopefully they stop using the term medical cannabis because you don't have medical uh, Oxycontin, medical, yeah, you know, all this other stuff. You know, and you're, you're right. You know, going in the future, it, it's going to be done. You know, with, within the next five years or so, you know, once they weed out, no pun intended, the um, <laughs> recreation from the medicinal, because we, we, we are on a route as a nation. We already have, what, nearly half the states have approved some form of faster medical marijuana. So more going than. More than that by more now? More than now, yes. Uh, 29 states. 29. And what do we need? We need uh, 34 for a constitutional amendment. 36. Yeah. 36? 36. Yeah. 36. Okay, but, but, you know, going going forward, you know, once we separate those, you are going to have, you know, actual uses and, you know, some organization is going to run it. And you're also right. Big Pharma is going to fight it. Big Pharma is going to fight it tooth and nail. You really don't have anybody to lobby Congress like for the cannabis industry like you do for Big Pharmacy. Until Big Pharma realizes the profit potential in it and then wants to step into it. And then you'll see Big Pharma lobbying Congress the other way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They'll show up in battleships and destroyers when they start <laughs> <Yeah>. lobbying. <laughs> Yeah, sure. the, the uh, big pharma has already been in in uh, in Nevada and tried to try to stop tried to stop this uh, SB three seventy four from passing this last term. But we have some really good legislatures up there, and they uh, they uh, held to their guns and didn't change their vote. So we got to give a shout out and a thank you to all of them. Speaking Especially of votes, tick. don't forget tomorrow, 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 city council, the um, 
the cannabis regulations have been trailed to the end of the meeting. Okay. Uh, that was on the agenda that I got in my email. But tomorrow they're going to be voting on the regulations for the city of Las Vegas. And they're going to also be voting on the coffin amendments, which I've finally read by now. <laughs> oh, have they published all of that now? Where, where, where can we find that? You can find that on the city of Las Vegas website. You click on... They, they, they don't make it easy, Mark. you you got to click on meetings and get to your city council and then click on the agenda, and then you have to go through the agenda to find what the exact item is. It's right. It's listed right before the 1 o'clock break, about five or six items up before the 1 o'clock break is where they have that item listed. And if you click on that, on the right-hand side, you'll have the different amendments listed. Click on them, you'll be able to read through. Mark, why have you on the phone um, again? Ha, what do you think about physician involvement or ownership uh, of a dispensary? And the body has very old rules that were written under Frankie Sudo Papa's reign in the mid '90s about Stark laws and uh, anti anti referral uh, violations and so on and so forth. But it, it, it's very interesting because some of the power players in the medical community including one in particular that's on the medical board, has put his name out there to have a, a medical dispensary and be uh, an owner-operator. So um, since we need physicians involved, we can't leave them outside because they're going to be seeing people with these chronic conditions and not have a lot of options in some situations. It, it would seem to me only logical that this would be a time that you would want to have the medical community involved and that another thing that needs to happen in the next legislature is some of these idiotic laws that were passed 15, 20 years ago need to be revisited and modified or stricken. Well, I would say that uh, the, the, the system would be well served by physicians being uh, principals in some of these facilities, any of these facilities, laboratories, cultivation facilities, dispensaries, production facilities, what have you. Uh, they bring an expertise, a medical expertise. This is a medical product, uh, after all. The one area that might be worthy of looking at is the referral issue. I can I can understand from a regulatory standpoint that if you're going to own a dispensary, that you would want to have some sort of oversight on the referrals to that dispensary, there being a potential conflict there. Uh, but you know, as far as uh, mere mere ownership, yeah, you could own it. You could uh, refer out to any other dispensary. Any other doctor who owns part of another dispensary could refer out to your dispensary. And you follow the general reasonable rules of uh, regarding conflicts of interest on referrals, uh, but you don't uh, eliminate physicians or medical doctors or experts in health care from having any interest in uh, medical marijuana establishments at all. That just doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Uh, we're ready to take our second break of the day. After the break, we'll continue with uh, Dan Rush from the UFCW and Dr. Ivan Goldsmith and attorney Mark Terbeek. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com WeCan702 is a Nevada cannabis community. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that meets in Southern Nevada. We are a social group that started in Las Vegas for patient support. We've been active in the community for over five years. If you'd like to join us on any of our events or parties, please contact us through Facebook at WeCan702 on Meetup at www.meetup.com forward slash WeCan702. Our website is www.wecan702.org. Be a part of the Nevada Cannabis Reform Revolution. Please join us and donate today. 
You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702-218-5226 or Kurt, K-U-R-T, at WeCan702.org. Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm in. Uh, uh, that, that, that you're Kurt Ducek. <laughs> Kurt Ducat, and I got Raymond Fletcher to me. I got Dr. Ivan Goldsmith, uh, Dan Rush, and Mark Terbeek. Uh, before we went to break, we were talking about uh, doctors uh, owning interest in, in uh, dispensaries and production facilities, and Raymond had a comment about something going on there. The, the referrals, you know, when you, when you go into your doctor, you know, and as, as a can, medical cannabis user, and I hope that. And I'm curious of other legitimate medical cannabis users like myself wonder the same thing. You know, you see these people go in to get their cards and they have a hangnail. That's the that's frustrating. So, you know, we we're talking about legislative things and doctors being involved and whatnot. I think it's imperative that doctors keep uh oversight of their peers and making sure that this opportunity isn't squandered by the few bad apples that don't want to wait until Nevada passes recreation and want to capitalize on claiming stubbing a toe. That's well, I don't know. It should be a legitimate concern. I don't though. know uh, many doctors that would uh, sign off as a stubbed toe as a chronic pain because it usually goes away rather quick. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, have a well, I tell you, it, it, that, that brings up an interesting point. I, look, at, honestly, let, let's, let's turn the clock back a little bit to 1996. Right? 1996, when California passed the nation's first um, medical marijuana law, it was everybody kind of knew that it was a saint uh, or a kind of a beard for um, recreational. Uh, and that was before a lot of research uh, had come to the fore. There had been research done on it, but it wasn't like really public. But that opened the door to publicizing a lot of this research. And lo and behold, over the last uh, 18, 20 years, we've discovered that, in fact, cannabis does have tremendous medical applications. It's also um, a, a party uh, substance, like alcohol. And it's distinguishing those two that's important. And, and I uh, agree, Ray, that this, this concept of if you're going to go for medical, be medical uh, about it, and let's focus on the medical. And medical is not going to go away when recreational comes to the fore. Uh, Jen and Kurt were in Colorado a couple of weeks ago, and they could just confirmed what I had always suspected. They went to Colorado, found that the uh, recreational was more expensive because uh, it was taxed higher, and it wasn't as nearly as good uh, as the medicinal, because they didn't have the medicinal quality to it. That's right. So all, the, gonna, all the stuff at the recreational stores was the stuff that they couldn't sell to the medical stores because they didn't want it. Yeah. It, yeah. it didn't help the patients, and you're absolutely right. Now, as a patient, as a patient now, and actually indulging in medical cannabis versus um, what somebody would use recreationally, I can certainly tell the difference. And for me, personally... The recreational stuff, all that did was give me a headache. The medicinal stuff, I didn't feel my pain, and I wasn't all high. You know, I didn't have that euphoric, you know, psycho whatever the heck that word is. Psychoactive. Thank you. I didn't have that issue. And, you know, I'm – and my, my concern, my concern about the patients and the doctor thing is because – all eyes are going to be on Las Vegas right now and how we do it because we are the entertainment capital of the world, and we do accept reciprocity. So, I mean, if we're going to be having this light shined on us, let's be a beacon. You know, let's truly set the stage and be an example, not only for the state, but for the nation, and say, you know what? This is the proper way to do it. This is exactly how you do it. And well, that's why I've, I've been working with uh, with Dan and the union on this uh, open ranking system, a transparent merits based system for making for getting the people who are going to provide the supply to the patients 
having them be the best players, race to the top approach, uh, best practices, and uh, and this brings me to a little bit of news. We we didn't do our our, our news roundup at uh, at the beginning of the hour, but there there has been a couple of of news developments that uh, inform this question. Uh, one is uh, recently the Nevada Supreme Court uh, finally authorized uh, Nevada attorneys to engage the medical cannabis legality debate by representing people and giving people a counseling and advice on the Nevada's medical cannabis law, which is good because there was a concern that uh, among a number of attorneys that maybe they would be subject to discipline uh, if something went wrong or if even something didn't get wrong. Mm-hmm. That issue has been clarified, and the Nevada Supreme Court has basically said to Nevada attorneys, uh, have at it. Uh, it's a legitimate field of legal advice. So does that mean our city attorney, uh, Brad Gerbic, is actually going to do his job now? Yeah, well, I tell you what, he doesn't have any cover for it now. He can't say, well, I don't know about the California Supreme Court, because, the, excuse me, the Nevada Supreme Court, because the Nevada Supreme Court said, yeah, you can advise, especially as a city attorney. Now, that was the biggest attorneys, cop out. Speaking of attorneys, i got to tell you, there was an, uh, a local attorney who's very well known around here who had his uh, fee agreement and client retention letter publicized by a blogger, and I have it up in front of my screen right now, and uh, that's an interesting thing that, I, that I've got there. It's uh, the inimitable Jay Brown, and it seems that... Uh, yeah, it didn't stop him from taking a lot of retainers' uh, word about the legal ethics and stop uh, his firm or him from taking a lot of retainers <laughs> months ago. Mm-hmm. And, and so we have this, this interesting conundrum with, uh, with Mr. Brown's representation is that he has a, a 9% piece of the action, at least in this one particular uh, letter that, that we have before us that's been publicized. He has a 9% uh, haircut on the deal, but he's not an owner. He doesn't have a, quote, ownership interest in it. He doesn't consider himself an owner. So um, that's, that's one of those uh, interesting things as we move forward uh, that we want to keep an eye on. Uh, because we want everybody involved in this, uh, in launching this program for Nevada, we want everybody to be up and up on it. And you know, Mark, I've seen, uh, i got to tell you, there's some people who have applied for these applications, and, and I'm kind of a neutral bystander, because I got into this just by chance, because another physician who had been doing it for years went to jail for um, a narcotics violation. And so these patients were just left stranded. And I started seeing these patients, and it dawned on me that these patients were really getting benefit from this medicine. They weren't seeking opiates. Um, they weren't um, besieging the medical system for unnecessary tests. And they felt genuinely better. But um, the doctors, most of the doctors in town have not embraced this. And there's going to be a need for you know several thousand people who are going to rush in. They're going to need to have these cards shortly in the next few months. And... Um, uh, the point of this is is that nobody should be in this to think that this is going to be a, a gold mine because I really don't see it as a gold mine because I, right now we have five, 6,000 people in the state. Some people say 9,000 are registered marijuana card players. A little more than 5,000 yeah, at what this I point thought. in that's the what entire state. So we're going to 4, launch all these dispensaries, the and we have a medical community that's apathetic to this issue. They, Most doctors probably would not write these cards or make the recommendations because they think it's not legitimate. And um, so you've got to have people in this that have a love for it and a passion and who are a little bit creative and, and not look at this as something that they're going to get rich overnight. Because I don't think you're going to get rich overnight with it, with, given the number of people that we have right now that have verified cards. Yeah, well, we've done, we've done studies based off of uh, Colorado, and uh, we estimate that there will be 60,000 patients uh, on the program within two years of the first dispensary opening. Harborside in Oakland alone has 85,000 patients, one dispensary serving 85,000. Now, they're the largest in the country, and they, they clearly have the highest revenues. But if we've only got 60 or 80 or even 100,000 patients here, you're talking about one or two dispensaries that have a, a million dollar a month, uh, $10, $10 million, $12 million a year revenue. Um, and one of the reasons that... Uh, that Mark and I and some others uh, five years ago back in the city of Oakland. Uh, Mark, do you remember when, when even the city called them growers and um, uh, dispensers and uh, bud tenders, and we didn't hear, uh, we didn't hear uh, phrases like, uh, we didn't hear vernacular like uh, technicians, nurseries, 
greenhouses, farmers, farms, right. patients. Farming versus cultivating, exactly. Right. There's, and, been, there's definitely been a, a, an advance in the terminology. And, and I, had a, I had an elected this morning throwing the f- very phrases that, uh, that we developed in this industry and in education and, and regulation uh, in helping electeds and bureaucrats find their way through the system. I remember when you first submitted uh, regulations to the state and um, so many people had submitted regulations and, and then they found out that, that the regs that you were submitting had been developed along with the, the Goldman Institute at the University of California um, uh, in Berkeley and uh, that there was actual uh, validity in what was going on. And, and folks that are in this to just make money, I think they should wait until the recreational side and Absolutely. the folks that, that want to do something for the community and, and for patients probably should be more focused on helping to define the industry, helping to define the vulnerabilities, who's vulnerable, because it's a, it's a universal vulnerability. Patients, workers, communities are all vulnerable. And, um, and it, at least if we stick with folks that have experience like yourself, Mark, and Dr. Goldstein, obviously, and st- um, I can't remember your name, brother. Raymond. 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 <laughs> Kurt and Jen and the folks. Sorry, Raymond. Um, you know, the folks that, that really brought this around, Senator Teager, Teager Bloom and uh, uh, Senator Hutchinson and folks that really put a lot of thought into this. And if we think about everybody that gets inf- affected by it, you know, we really want to do something for the workers. So we really want to create an environment that's safe for communities. We want to do something that provides a real safe access for patients and, and that, uh, you know, they're getting good medicine. And, and like Stuart pointed out, um, you know, you go to Colorado, you get a... You get what's left over, you know, and, and uh, I mean, there's, there's really got to be a focus on f- by folks that want to build an industry, serve patients like we can, um, you know, legislators and bureaucrats that want to want to regulate an industry that is appropriate and dignified and, and uh, safe. And, and, uh, and that's what the union's here to do. And, um, and, and we've been real glad to work with we can and also Mark and, just real quickly, I'm the director of Cannabis Workers Rising for UFCW International. I'm not the head of the union. That's my boss. His name's Joe Hansen, and uh, and uh, I like to point that out. Uh, but thanks, <laughs> no problem, well, guys. Well, what you say, Dan, is important, and it's what, why I, I emphasize that every aspect of the process here should be clean and above board. And we want the regulators and the decision makers here. To, uh, to be very mindful of that. So then when they see an application or a group in front of them, and, uh, Neutral. and we want them to be completely squeaky clean, and if there's any sort of skeevy uh, energy there, we, we want them to take a pass on that group. And I'm, I'm telling you, and it's just like uh, it's, we've always advocated uh, clear, transparent, rank-based, points-based, race-to-the-top process. And, and folks here, especially bureaucrats and elected, need to understand that <coughs> That they're, you know, the whole world is looking at what's going on here. And Stuart's right. We do have to be the beacon of what goes on here. Raymond. I mean, Raymond. I'm sorry, Raymond. <laughs> I'm so the Stuart sorry. was a call in guy. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Raymond. No, it's okay. Um, I mean, we have to be the beacon. And, and uh, elected's got to understand they got to do this right. Race to the top. Yes, race Transparency. To the top. Yep. And on that note, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Uh, check us out at WeCan702.org for our past radio broadcasts and ways to help and get involved. Thank you once again. This is uh, Kurt signing out for Nevada Cannabis News. <laughs>